Would you please stand and join as we sing our opening hymn, verses 1, 2, and 6 of hymn number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth. Please be seated. 
First of all, let me welcome everybody to this time of worship. Um, we've got the church decorated, and I'd like to ask all of those who participated in doing that yesterday to stand so we can just give them a round of applause. And I think Gail was here, and she's not here yet. And I miss Al and Carlotta was here, and she said she was going to see the Falcons today, so we'll keep her lifted in prayer. I said to her, you know, they didn't lose last week. She said they didn't play. <laughs> so so it's, it, it, let me just say welcome. Um, and I, I think those are the announcements. Uh, next week, we'll start our Advent readings. Next week is the first week in, in Advent. So I may be asking some of you all as families to come up and do the Advent reading, and I'll send the readings out to you in advance. So we'll go from there. Anything I'm missing? Then let us pray. Most gracious and eternal God, as we come to this time of worship, we invite your presence into this sanctuary. And Lord, we stand on the promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are present also. So Lord, we lift you up in praise, and our prayer is that we would experience the blessing of worship that comes from being with you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So let's do a couple of congregational hymns. Somebody pick one or so, and we'll go through and, and do a couple of these. 354.
I'm going to pick one. How about 240? That should kick off the season pretty well. If the ushers would please come. If you'd remain standing and join me as we share together now from Psalm 107, it's on page 830 in the hymn book. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good, whose steadfast love endures forever. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city in which to dwell. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord who delivered them from their distress. Them, 
Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. The Lord turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground. The Lord turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a, a fruitful yield. They multiply grapes by the blessing of the Lord. Thou not let their cattle When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, trouble, and sorrow, the Lord pours contempt upon princes and makes them wander in trackless ways. The, up, the upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness stops in its mouth. Please be seated. Um, I'm going to ask you, after I pray, to join me in this prayer that's published in the bulletin today, and then we'll follow that with the Lord's Prayer. So let us go to God in prayer. Lord God, we come today as your thankful people. And Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. Lord, we live in a country that's not perfect, but it is so far ahead of anywhere else that we're just blessed. And we know that you're the creator, you're the one that has endowed us with the freedoms that we share. Lord, we say thank you today for the hostages that have been released in Gaza. And we ask that you would continue to intervene that all of the hostages might be set free. Lord, our deeper prayer is that it, at some time, at some time in our lives, that we might see peace on earth, that we might see the cessation of all wars. And Lord, that we might dwell together as the people of God as the prophet Isaiah says, we may dwell in a place where the lion and the lamb lay down together. And Lord, for those that wrestle with illness today, we ask that you would touch them with your healing finger, that you would wrap your arms around them to give them comfort, that you would endow those who tend them with your knowledge. Lord, for those that walk ever so closely to the valley of the shadow of death, we ask that you would give them comfort. We ask that you would give them assurance that those who have put on Christ look to that great day of your coming, a great day of return and reunion. And Lord, for those who have lost loved ones, we ask that you would, that you would just give them your comfort, that you would give them your peace. Lord, we pray for those who lead our churches. We pray for those who lead our governments. Lord, we pray for those who are in leadership around the world that they might be on your agenda and not on their own. And Lord, we pray together now the prayer that is planted in the bulletin. Thanks to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits which you have given us, for all the pains and insults which you have borne for us. Most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more deeply, love you more dearly, and follow you more closely for your own sake. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Would you please stand now as we sing together hymn number 694, Come Ye Thankful People, Come.
please be seated. I'd like to share with you today from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, and I'll be reading in the fourth chapter, beginning at the fourth and reading through the seventh verse. And hear what the Apostle Paul writes. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. You know, last Thursday was Thanksgiving Day, but I suspect that I don't need to tell you that. And if you need a reminder, all you have to do is go and step on the bathroom scale, and I'm sure that you'll realize what a day that was. Like millions of the other Americans, we celebrated in light of a long tradition of national thanks that stems way back to 1621. Thanksgiving is a day which is deeply tied to our national heritage and our understanding of who we are as a people, a heritage that is tied to a group of pilgrims who gathered after that first devastating winter where many had died. No family was untouched by sickness, disease, malnutrition, and death. And yet, although they faced the possibility of another hard winter, they gathered with the Indians to recognize God's grace and love, giving the hope and helping them to continue on. I can't help but believe that this heritage that they came, that they brought, inspired the founding fathers to write the words, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed, endowed, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Words that recognize and thank God for the freedoms that we share. As I thought about the harsh winters and the lives lost in the Revolutionary War, it occurred to me that it is easy to forget, easy for us to take for granted those things for which others fought so hard and endured so much. As we gathered around the Thanksgiving table, I wonder how much we really thought about the source of our bounty. You know, we need to remember that all things come from God. Today, our nation lives in unprecedented prosperity, and yet there are rifts in our society that threaten to tear our nation apart. There are great political divisions. There are moral questions that beg to be addressed. There's a wide divide between the rich and the poor. And one preacher I know offers some thoughts about how a nation can be healed. And hear what he says. There's only only one road that we can travel if we're not to become lost. One road forward healing the wounds of our nation. One road toward survival as a species. One road that can deliver to us our hopes and and move us toward our goals as a nation. And that road begins in thanksgiving. We need to stand at the summit overlooking the landscape we are called to cross with an ancient people of Israel, and we need to say as they said, a wandering Aramean was my father, And God delivered us. He brought us into this good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
You know, I thought about that, and, and as I thought about some of the divisions that occur in our country, it occurred to me that maybe some of the milk has curdled and some of the honey has become sugar. We need to begin that road recognizing that this place, this time, as well as all of the gifts we have received came from another hand, a greater hand bestowed upon us for safekeeping and for use by a father to whom it all still belongs. We need this sense of historical recall, a different and larger perspective. We need to lay the important, we need to lay our historical perspective on top of the perspective of those who first saw this gift and who realized the importance of the gifts we have received. We need to stand once more on the edge of the promised land as if we had no inheritance, to understand just what a marvelous gift it is that God has placed in our hands. Then we will see more clearly God's will and God's purpose for us. We will see why it was that our ancestors were willing to suffer and die for this gift. We will see the hope that guided them to this place. We will see the vision that they held of a good land, a land once again flowing with milk and honey. We will see the alabaster cities gleam, unsustained, unstained by human tears. Seeing with their clearer vision, we will come to a better understanding of the task that lies before us of becoming one country indivisible with liberty and justice for all, of becoming a place where the tired, the poor, and the teeming masses yearning to be free can find a beacon of light and of hope and of salvation in a world that is threatened by darkness. This all begins when we are grateful for the endowment that God has left us, Thanksgiving begins with noticing what is all around us. And as I thought about that, I was reminded of a, of a fable, of a parable, where there was a person who was a dictator, and he had an ironclad victim over the territory that he ruled, except for one frustrating area. He was unable to destroy the people's belief in God. He summoned all of his counselors around him and asked them the question, where can I hide God so that the people will end up forgetting him? One counselor suggested that God could be hidden on the dark side of the moon. This proposal was debated for some period of time, but, but they voted down because one day believed that the scientists would be able to discover a means of space travel and God would end up being found again. Another advisor came with the idea of burying God in the depths of the ocean. This was voted down for basically the same reason. It was felt that scientific advancement would lead to the discovery of God, even beneath the depths of the urban floor. Finally, the oldest and the wisest of the counselors came. And he said, I know, why don't we hide God where no one will ever think of finding him? And here was the explanation that he gave. If we hide God in the ordinary events of people's everyday lives, they will never find him. As I reflected on that parable, a poem that I read some number of years ago, a poem called the Aurora Lee that was written by the, the poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning came to mind. And what she says is this. She reminds us that each of us every day has the opportunity to have a Moses kind of burning bush experience, to find God in our everyday experience. And she penned these words. Earth crammed full of heaven and every common bush of fire with God, but only he who sees and takes off 
his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck backberries and dab their natural faces unaware. I wonder how many of us take the opportunity to see these bushes that are, that are crowned with God's fire and how many of us simply sit around and pick blackberries, as she said. You see, a grateful heart sees each day as a gift from God and thankful people focus less on what they lack and more on the privilege that they have. Max Lucado, one of my favorite authors, says it this way. The grateful heart is like a magnet sweeping over the day, collecting reasons for gratitude. You see, I've come to the understanding that it's gratitude that gets us through the difficult times in life. Gratitude gets us through the hard stuff. To reflect on blessings is the rehearsal of God's accomplishments. To rehearse God's accomplishments is to discover his heart, and to discover his heart is to discover the good gifts, and not only the good gifts, but the good giver as well. Gratitude always leaves us looking at God and away from dread. It does to anxiety what the morning sun does to valley mist. It burns it up. A great American theologian offers this thought about being thankful. The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. These bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added, which are also extraordinary in nature, that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. Some of you all may recognize those words that I said were from a great American theologian because the person who wrote them was Abraham Lincoln and he wrote them in the middle of the Civil War. Lincoln continues in this, population has steadily increased Notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege and the battlefield and the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins hath nevertheless remembered mercy, it has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and greatly acknowledged as with one heart and by one voice with the American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set aside and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. This, my brothers and sisters, was the institution of the celebration that we came to know as Thanksgiving. But let me remind you that just as Lincoln was writing in the midst of the Civil War. So was Paul in jail, in prison, awaiting execution, and still could say with thanksgiving in another letter that he wrote to the church at Ephesus from the same prison cell, give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as I was studying and rehearsing for the message today, 
the overwhelming thought came to me that I should tell God how thankful I am for what he has done and what he will do for me each and every day. So based on something that I read in a book by C.S. Lewis, a book entitled The Screwtape Letters, where Screwtape writes back each time, affectionately yours, I've entitled this letter, Gratefully Yours. And it goes like this. Dear God, I want to thank you for touching me this morning. I want to thank you for clothing me in my right mind, for the jam that was on my toast, and for the milk on my cereal. I want to say thank you. For the air that I breathe and the lungs that inhale, thank you. For a brain that is more intelligent than any artificial intelligence that computers can produce, and a heart that beats some three billion times over an average life, every hour of every day, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the hostages that have been freed from Gaza. Thank you, Lord, for my wife who has supported me through all these years and continues to be my best friend. Thank you, Lord. For this great congregation who seek to share the good news of Jesus in this community, thank you for the privilege, for the privilege of being the pastor of this great church. I'm thankful. Lord, for the valleys, for the failures that have humbled me and those that will humble me in the future. For the mountaintops, for the successes that has encouraged and sustained me and for those that will occur and sustain and encourage me in the future I give you thanks for all that is past and all that is present and for all that the future will bring I say thank you but most of all Lord I thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who gave his life that I might be reconciled to you. And my letter is signed, gratefully yours, Chuck Savage. As I thought about that, there was a song that came to my mind, and the words go something like this. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son. I want to leave you with this thought this morning. Every day of every hour, Look for those common bushes afire with God. And when you see them, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. And I encourage each of you to write your own letter to God and sign it gratefully yours. Let us pray. 
Most gracious and eternal God, we thank you for all that you've meant in every life. We thank you for every one that you've touched. And Lord, our prayer is that our lives might be a life of thanksgiving, that we might see those burning bushes, those that are aflame with you in everyday life. And we ask these things in the mighty and powerful name of the one who died for our sins, the one who hung on Calvary's cross that we might be reconciled, Jesus our Christ. And God's children all said, so if we can stand now and sing verses 3, 4, and 5 of hymn 92 once again. Most gracious and eternal God, we as your grateful people seek your communion. And Lord, we go now with that communion, with the sweet spirit of your Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. 